Section 5 of Chapter 25 of A History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 25, Section 5. Animated by such feelings as these, a party in the upper house was eager to take the earliest opportunity of making a stand. On the 4th of April the second reading was moved. Near a hundred lords were present. Somers, whose serene wisdom and persuasive eloquence had seldom been more needed, was confined to his room by illness, and his place on the woolsack was supplied by the Earl of Bridgewater. Several orators, both Whig and Tory, objected to proceeding farther, but the chiefs of both parties thought it better to try the almost hopeless experiment of committing the bill and sending it back amended to the Commons. The second reading was carried by seventy votes to twenty-three. It was remarked that both Portland and Albemarle voted in the majority. In the committee and on the third reading, several amendments were proposed and carried. Wharton, the boldest and most active of the Whig peers, and the Lord Privy Seal Lonsdale, one of the most moderate and reasonable of the Tories, took the lead and were strenuously supported by the Lord President Pembroke, and by the Archbishop of Canterbury, who seems on this occasion to have a little forgotten his habitual sobriety and caution. Two natural sons of Charles the Second, Richmond and Southampton, who had strong personal reasons for disliking resumption bills, were zealous on the same side. No peer, however, as far as can now be discovered, ventured to defend the way in which William had disposed of his Irish domains. The provisions which annulled the grants of those domains were left untouched, but the words of which the effect was to vest in the parliamentary trustees' property which had never been forfeited to the king and had never been given away by him were altered, and the clauses by which estates and sums of money were, in defiance of constitutional principle and of immemorial practice, bestowed on persons who were favourites of the commons, were so far modified as to be, in form, somewhat less exceptionable. The bill, improved by these changes, was sent down by two judges to the lower house. The lower house was all in a flame. There was now no difference of opinion there. Even those members who thought that the resumption bill and the land tax bill ought not to have been tacked together, yet felt that, since these bills had been tacked together, it was impossible to agree to the amendments made by the Lords without surrendering one of the most precious privileges of the Commons. The amendments were rejected without one dissentient voice. It was resolved that a conference should be demanded and the gentlemen who were to manage the conference were instructed to say merely that the upper house had no right to alter a money bill, that the point had long been settled and was too clear for argument, that they should leave the bill with the lords, and that they should leave with the lords also the responsibility of stopping the supplies which were necessary for the public service. Several votes of menacing sound were passed at the same sitting. It was Monday, the 8th of April. Tuesday, the 9th, was allowed to the other house for reflection and repentance. It was resolved that on the Wednesday morning the question of the Irish forfeitures should again be taken into consideration, and that every member who was in town should be then in his place on peril of the highest displeasure of the house. It was moved and carried that every privy councillor who had been concerned in procuring 
or passing any exorbitant grant for his own benefit had been guilty of a high crime and misdemeanor lest the courtiers should flatter themselves that this was meant to be a mere abstract proposition it was ordered that a list of the members of the privy council should be laid on the table as it was thought not improbable that the crisis might end in an appeal to the constituent bodies nothing was omitted which could excite out of doors a feeling in favour of the bill the speaker was directed to print and publish the report signed by the four commissioners not accompanied as in common justice it ought to have been by the protest of the three dissentients but accompanied by several extracts from the journals which were thought likely to produce an impression favourable in the house and unfavourable to the court all these resolutions passed without any division and without as far as appears any debate there was indeed much speaking but all on one side seymour harley howe harcourt shower musgrave declaimed one after the other about the obstinacy of the other house the alarming state of the country the dangers which threatened the public peace and the public credit if it was said none but englishmen sat in the parliament and in the council we might hope that they would relent at the thought of the calamities which impend over england but we have to deal with men who are not englishmen with men who consider this country as their own only for evil as their property not as their home who when they have gorged themselves with our wealth will without one uneasy feeling leave us sunk in bankruptcy distracted by faction exposed without defence to invasion a new war said one of these orators a new war as long as bloody and as costly as the last would do less mischief than has been done by the introduction of that batch of dutchmen among the barons of the realm another was so absurd as to call on the house to declare that whoever should advise a dissolution would be guilty of high treason a third gave utterance to a sentiment which it is difficult to understand how any assembly of civilized and christian men even in a moment of strong excitement should have heard without horror they object to tacking do they let them take care that they do not provoke us to tack in earnest how would they like to have bills of supply with bills of attainder tacked to them this atrocious threat worthy of the tribune of the french convention in the worst days of the jacobin tyranny seems to have been passed unreprehended it was meant such at least was the impression at the dutch embassy to intimidate Somers, he was confined by illness he had been unable to take any part in the proceedings of the lords and he had privately blamed them for engaging in a conflict in which he justly thought that they could not be victorious nevertheless the tory leaders hoped that they might be able to direct against him the whole force of the storm which they had raised seymour in particular encouraged by the wild and almost savage temper of his hearers harangued with rancorous violence against the wisdom and the virtue which presented the strongest contrast to his own turbulence insolence faithlessness and rapacity no doubt he said the lord chancellor was a man of parts anybody might be glad to have for counsel so acute and eloquent an advocate but a very good advocate might be a very bad minister and of all the ministers who had brought the kingdom into difficulties this plausible fair-spoken person was the most dangerous 
nor was the old reprobate ashamed to add that he was afraid that his lordship was no better than a hobbist in religion after a long sitting the members separated but they reassembled early on the morning of the following day tuesday the ninth of april a conference was held, and Seymour, as chief manager for the Commons, returned the bill and the amendments to the peer in the manner which had been prescribed to him. From the painted chamber he went back to the lower house and reported what had passed. If, he said, I may venture to judge by the looks and manner of their lordships, all will go right. But... Within half an hour evil tidings came through the court of requests and the lobbies. The lords had divided on the question whether they would adhere to their amendments. Forty-seven had voted for adhering, and thirty-four for giving way. The House of Commons broke up with gloomy looks, and in great agitation. All London looked forward to the next day with painful forebodings. The general feeling was in favour of the bill. It was rumoured that the majority which had determined to stand by the amendments had been swollen by several prelates, by several of the illegitimate sons of Charles the Second, and by several needy and greedy courtiers. The cry in all the public places of resort was that the nation would be ruined by the three B's bishops bastards and beggars on wednesday the tenth at length the contest came to a decisive issue both houses were early crowded the lords demanded a conference it was held and pembroke delivered back to seymour the bill and the amendments together with a paper containing a concise but luminous and forcible exposition of the grounds on which the lords conceived themselves to be acting in a constitutional and strictly defensive manner this paper was read at the bar but whatever effect it may now produce on a dispassionate student of history it produced none on the thick ranks of country gentlemen it was instantly resolved that the bill should again be sent back to the lords with a peremptory announcement that the Commons' determination was unalterable. The Lords again took the amendments into consideration. During the last forty-eight hours great exertions had been made in various quarters to avert a complete rupture between the houses. The statesmen of the Junto were far too wise not to see that it would be madness to consider the struggle longer. It was indeed necessary, unless the kings and the lords were to be of as little weight in the state as in 1648, unless the house was not merely to exercise a general control over the government, but to be, as in the days of the rump, itself the whole government, the sole legislative chamber, the fountain from which were to flow all the favours which had hitherto been in the gift of the crown that a determined stand should be made. But, in order that such a stand might be successful, the ground must be carefully selected, for a defeat might be fatal. The Lords must wait for some occasion on which their privileges would be bound up with the privileges of all Englishmen, for some occasion on which the constituent bodies would, if an appeal were made to them, disavow the acts of the representative body, and this was not such an occasion. The enlightened and large-minded few considered tacking as a practice so pernicious that it would be justified only by an emergency which would justify a resort to physical force. But in the many, tacking, when employed for a popular end, excited little or no disapprobation the public which seldom troubles itself with nice distinctions could not be made to understand that the question at issue was any other than this 
whether a sum which was vulgarly estimated at millions, and which undoubtedly amounted to some hundreds of thousands, should be employed in paying the debts of the state and alleviating the load of taxation, or in making Dutchmen, who were already too rich, still richer. It was evident that on that question the Lords could not hope to have the country with them, and that, if a general election took place while that question was unsettled, the new House of Commons would be even more mutinous and impractical than the present House. Summers, in his sick chamber, had given this opinion. Orford had voted for the bill in every stage. Montague, though no longer a minister, had obtained admission to the royal closet, and had strongly represented to the king the dangers which threatened the state. The king had at length consented to let it be understood that he considered the passing of the bill as on the whole the less of two great evils. It was soon clear that the temper of the peers had undergone a considerable alteration since the preceding day. Scarcely any, indeed, changed sides, but not a few abstained from voting. Wharton, who had at first spoken powerfully for the amendments, left town for Newmarket. On the other hand, some lords who had not yet taken their part came down to give a healing vote. Among them were the two persons to whom the education of the young heir apparent had been entrusted, Marlborough and Burnet. Marlborough showed his usual prudence. He had remained neutral, while by taking a part he must have offended either the House of Commons or the King. He took a part as soon as he saw that it was possible to please both. Burnet, alarmed for the public peace, was in a state of great excitement, and, as was usual with him when in such a state, forgot dignity and decorum, called out stuff in a very audible voice while a noble lord was haranguing in favour of the amendments, and was in great danger of being reprimanded at the bar or delivered over to Black Rod. The motion on which the division took place was that the House do adhere to the amendments. There were forty contents and thirty-seven not contents. Proxies were called, and the numbers were found to be exactly even. In the House of Lords there is no casting vote. When the numbers are even, the non-contents have it. The motion to adhere had therefore been negatived. But this was not enough. It was necessary that an affirmative resolution should be moved to the effect that the House agreed to the bill without amendments. And if the numbers should again be equal, this motion would also be lost. It was an anxious moment. Fortunately, the primate's heart failed him. He had obstinately fought the battle down to the last stage, but he probably felt it was no light thing to take on himself, and to bring on his order the responsibility of throwing the whole kingdom into confusion. He started up and hurried out of the house, beckoning to some of his brethren. His brethren followed him with a prompt obedience which, serious as the crisis was, caused no small merriment. In consequence of this defection, the motion to agree was carried by a majority of five. Meanwhile the members of the other house had been impatiently waiting for news, and had been alternately elated and depressed by the reports which followed one another in rapid succession. At first it was confidently expected that the peers would yield, and there was general good humour. Then came intelligence that the majority of the peers present had voted for adhering to the amendments. I believe, so Vernon wrote the next day, I believe there was not one man in the house that did not think the nation ruined. 
the lobbies were cleared the back doors were locked the keys were laid on the table the sergeant at arms was directed to take his post at the front door and to suffer no member to withdraw an awful interval followed during which the angry passions of the assembly seemed to be subdued by terror some of the leaders of the opposition men of grave character and of large property stood aghast at finding that they were engaged they scarcely knew how in a conflict such as they had not at all expected in a conflict in which they could be victorious only at the expense of the peace and order of society even seymour was sobered by the greatness and nearness of the danger even howe thought it advisable to hold conciliatory language it was no time he said for wrangling court party and country party were englishmen alike their duty was to forget all past grievances and to cooperate heartily for the purpose of saving the country in a moment all was changed a message from the lords was announced it was a message which lightened many hearts the bill had been passed without amendments the leading malcontents who a few minutes before scared by finding that their violence had brought on a crisis for which they were not prepared had talked about the duty of mutual forgiveness and close union instantly became again as rancorous as ever one danger they said was over so far well but it was the duty of the representatives of the people to take such steps as might make it impossible that there should ever again be such danger every adviser of the crown who had been concerned in the procuring or passing of any exorbitant grant ought to be excluded from all access to the royal ear a list of the privy councillors furnished in conformity with the order made two days before was on the table that list the clerk was ordered to read prince george of denmark and the archbishop of canterbury passed without remark but as soon as the chancellor's name had been pronounced the rage of his enemies broke forth twice already in the course of that stormy session they had attempted to ruin his fame and his fortunes and twice his innocence and his calm fortitude had confounded all their politics perhaps in the state of excitement to which the house had been wrought up a third attack on him might be successful orator after orator declaimed against him he was the great offender he was responsible for all the grievances of which the nation complained he had obtained exorbitant grants for himself he had defended the exorbitant grants obtained by others he had not indeed been able in the late debates to raise his own voice against the just demands of the nation but it might well be suspected that he had in secret prompted the ungracious answer of the king and encouraged the pertinacious resistance of the lords sir john levison gower a noisy and acrimonious tory called for impeachment but musgrave an abler and more experienced politician saw that if the imputations which the opposition had been in the habit of throwing on the chancellor were exhibited with the precision of a legal charge their futility would excite universal derision and thought it more expedient to move that the house should without assigning any reason request the king to remove lord somers from his majesty's councils and presence for ever cowper defended his persecuted friend with great eloquence and effect and he was warmly supported by many members who had been zealous for the resumption of the irish grants only a hundred and six members went into the lobby with musgrave a hundred and sixty-seven voted against him 
such a division in such a house of commons and on such a day is sufficient evidence of the respect which the great qualities of somers had extorted even from his political enemies end of section five six of chapter twenty five of a history of england by thomas babington macaulay this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of england by thomas babington macaulay chapter twenty five section six the clerk then went on with the list the lord president and the lord privy seal who were well known to have stood up strongly for the privileges of the lords were reviled by some angry members but no motion was made against either and soon the tories became uneasy in their turn for the name of the duke of leeds was read he was one of themselves they were very unwilling to put a stigma on him yet how could they just after declaiming against the chancellor for accepting a very moderate and well-earned provision undertake the defence of a statesman who had out of grants pardons and bribes accumulated a princely fortune there was actually evidence on the table that his grace was receiving from the bounty of the crown more than thrice as much as had been bestowed on summers and nobody could doubt that his grace's secret gains had very far exceeded those of which there was evidence on the table it was accordingly moved that the house which had indeed been sitting massy hours should adjourn the motion was lost but neither party was disposed to move that the consideration of the list should be resumed it was however resolved without a division that an address should be presented to the king requesting that no person not a native of his dominions prince george excepted might be admitted to the privy council either of england or of ireland the evening was now far spent the candles had been some time lighted and the house rose so ended one of the most anxious turbulent and variously eventful days in the long parliamentary history of england what the morrow would have produced if time had been allowed for a renewal of hostilities can only be guessed the supplies had been voted the king was determined not to receive the address which requested him to disgrace his dearest and most trusty friends indeed he would have prevented the passing of that address by proroguing parliament on the preceding day had not the lords risen the moment after they had agreed to the resumption bill he had actually come from kensington to the treasury for that purpose and his robes and crown were in readiness he now took care to be at westminster in good time the commons had scarcely met when the knock of black rod was heard they repaired to the other house the bills were passed and bridgewater by the royal command prorogued the parliament for the first time since the revolution the session closed without a speech from the throne William was too angry to thank the commons, and too prudent to reprimand them. The health of James had been during some years declining, and he had at length, on Good Friday, 1701, suffered a shock from which he had never recovered. While he was listening in his chapel to the solemn service of the day, he fell down in a fit and remained long insensible some people imagined that the words of the anthem which his choristers were chanting had produced in him emotions too violent to be borne by an enfeebled body and mind for that anthem was taken from the plaintive elegy in which a servant of the true god chastened by many sorrows and humiliations banished 
homesick, and living on the bounty of strangers, bewailed the fallen throne and the desolate temple of Sion. Remember, O Lord, what is come upon us, consider and behold our reproach. Our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens. The crown has fallen from our head. Wherefore does thou forget us forever? The king's malady proved to be paralytic. Phagon, the first physician of the French court, and on medical questions, the oracle of all Europe, prescribed the waters of Bourbon. Louis, with all his usual generosity, sent to Saint-Germain ten thousand crowns in gold for the charges of the journey, and gave orders that every town along the road should receive his good brother with all the honours due to royalty. James, after passing some time at Bourbon, returned to the neighbourhood of Paris with health so far re-established that he was able to take exercise on horseback, but with judgment and memory evidently impaired. On the 13th of September he had a second fit in his chapel, and it soon became clear that this was a final stroke. He rallied the last energies of his failing body and mind to testify his firm belief in the religion for which he had sacrificed so much. He received the last sacraments with every mark of devotion, exhorted his son to hold fast to the true faith in spite of all temptations, and entreated Middleton, who almost alone among the courtiers assembled in the bedchamber, professed himself a Protestant, to take refuge from doubt and error in the bosom of the one infallible church. After the extreme unction had been administered, James declared that he pardoned all his enemies, and named particularly the Prince of Orange, the Princess of Denmark, and the Emperor. The Emperor's name he repeated with peculiar emphasis. Take notice, father, he said to the confessor, that I forgive the emperor with all my heart. It may perhaps seem strange that he should have found this the hardest of all exercises of Christian charity, but it must be remembered that the emperor was the only Roman Catholic prince still living who had been accessory to the revolution, and that James might not unnaturally consider Roman Catholics who had been accessory to the revolution as more inexcusably guilty than heretics who might have deluded themselves into the belief that, in violating their duty to him, they were discharging their duty to God. While James was still able to understand what was said to him, and make intelligible answers, Lewis visited him twice. The English exiles observed that the most Christian king was to the last considerate and kind in the very slightest matters which concerned his unfortunate guest. He would not allow his coach to enter the court of Saint-Germain, lest the noise of the wheels should be heard in the sick room. In both interviews he was gracious, friendly, and even tender. But he carefully abstained from saying anything about the future position of the family which was about to lose its head. Indeed, he could say nothing, for he had not yet made up his own mind. Soon, however, it became necessary for him to form some resolution. On the 16th, James sank into a stupor which indicated the near approach of death. While he lay in this helpless state, Madame de Maintenon visited his consort. To this visit many persons who were likely to be well informed attributed a long series of great events. We cannot wonder that a woman should have been moved to pity by the misery of a woman that a devout Roman Catholic should have taken a deep interest 
in the fate of a family persecuted, as she conceived, solely for being Roman Catholics, or that the pride of the widow of Scarron should have been intensely gratified by the supplications of a daughter of Este and a queen of England. From mixed motives, probably, the wife of Lewis promised her more powerful protection to the wife of James. Madame de Maintenon was just leaving Saint-Germain when, on the brow of the hill which overlooks the valley of the Seine, she met her husband who had come to ask after his guest. It was probable at this moment that he was persuaded to form a resolution of which neither he nor she, by whom he was governed, foresaw the consequences. Before he announced that resolution, however, he observed all the decent forms of deliberation. A council was held that evening at Marley, and was attended by the princes of the blood, and by the ministers of state. The question was propounded whether, when God should take James the Second of England to himself, France should recognize the pretender as King James the Third. The ministers were, one and all, against the recognition. Indeed, it seems difficult to understand how any person who had any pretensions to the name of statesman should have been of a different opinion. Torcy took his stand on the grounds that to recognize the Prince of Wales would be to violate the Treaty of Rizek. This was indeed an impregnable position. By that treaty his Most Christian Majesty had bound himself to do nothing which could, directly or indirectly, disturb the existing order of things in England, and in what way, except by an actual invasion, could he do more to disturb the existing order of things in England than by solemnly declaring, in the face of the whole world, that he did not consider that order of things as legitimate, that he regarded the Bill of Rights and the Act of Settlement as nullities, and the King in possession as a usurper. The recognition would then be a breach of faith, and even if all considerations of morality were set aside, it was plain that it would at that moment be wise in the French government to avoid every thing which could with plausibility be represented as a breach of faith. The crisis was a very peculiar one. The great diplomatic victory won by France in the preceding year had excited the fear and hatred of her neighbours. Nevertheless there was, as yet, no great coalition against her. The House of Austria, indeed, had appealed to arms. But with the House of Austria alone, the House of Bourbon could easily deal. Other powers were still looking in doubt to England for the signal. And England, though her aspect was sullen and menacing, still preserved neutrality. That neutrality would not have lasted so long if William could have relied on the support of his Parliament and of his people. In his Parliament there were agents of France who, though few, had obtained so much influence by clamouring against standing armies, profuse grants, and Dutch favourites, that they were often blindly followed by the majority, and his people, distracted by domestic factions, unaccustomed to busy themselves about continental politics, and remembering with bitterness the disasters and burdens of the last war, the carnage of London, the loss of the Smyrna fleet, the land tax at four shillings in the pound, hesitated about engaging in another contest, and would probably continue to hesitate while he continued to live. He could not live long. It had indeed often been prophesied that his death was at hand, and the prophets had hitherto been mistaken. But there was now no possibility of mistake. His cough was more violent than ever, his legs were swollen, his eyes, once bright and clear as those of a falcon, had grown dim. 
he who on the day of the boyne had been sixteen hours on the backs of different horses could now with great difficulty creep into his stage coach the vigorous intellect and the intrepid spirit remained but on the body fifty years had done the work of ninety in a few months the vaults of westminster would receive the emaciated and shattered frame which was animated by the most far-sighted the most daring the most commanding of souls in a few months the british throne would be filled by a woman whose understanding was well known to be feeble and who was believed to lean towards the party which was averse from war to get over those few months without an open and violent rupture should have been the first object of the french government every engagement should have been punctually fulfilled every occasion of quarrel should have been studiously avoided nothing should have been spared which could quiet the alarms and soothe the wounded pride of neighbouring nations the house of bourbon was so situated that one year of moderation might not improbably be rewarded by thirty years of undisputed ascendancy was it possible the politic and experienced lewis would at such a conjuncture offer a new and most galling provocation not only to william whose animosity was already as great as it could be but to the people whom william had hitherto been vainly endeavouring to inspire with animosity resembling his own how often since the revolution of sixteen eighty eight had it seemed that the english were thoroughly weary of the new government and how often had the detection of a jacobite plot or the approach of a french armament changed the whole face of things all at once the grumbling had ceased the grumblers had crowded to sign loyal addresses to the usurper had formed associations in support of his authority had appeared in arms at the head of the militia crying god save king william so it would be now most of those who had taken a pleasure in crossing him on the question of his dutch guards on the question of his irish grants would be moved to vehement resentment when they learned that lewis had in direct violation of a treaty determined to force on england a king of his own religion a king bred in his own dominions a king who would be at westminster what philip was at madrid a great feudatory of france these arguments were concisely but clearly and strongly urged by torcy in a paper which is still extant and which it is difficult to believe that his master can have read without great misgivings on one side were the faith of treaties the peace of europe the welfare of france nay the selfish interest of the house of bourbon on the other side were the influence of an artful woman and the promptings of vanity which we must in candour acknowledge was ennobled by a mixture of compassion and chivalrous generosity the king determined to act in direct opposition to the advice of all his ablest servants and the princes of the blood applauded his decision as they would have applauded any decision which he had announced nowhere was he regarded with a more timorous a more slavish respect than in his own family on the following day he went again to saint germain and attended by a splendid retinue entered james's bedchamber the dying man scarcely opened his heavy eyes and then closed them again i have something said lewis of great moment to communicate to your majesty the courtiers who filled the room took this as a signal to retire and were crowding towards the door when they were stopped by that commanding voice 
let nobody withdraw. I come to tell your majesty that, whenever it shall please God to take you from us, I will be to your son what I have been to you, and will acknowledge him as King of England, Scotland, and Ireland. The English exiles who were standing round the couch fell to their knees. Some burst into tears. Some poured forth praises and blessings with clamour, such as was scarcely becoming in such a place and at such a time. Some indistinct murmurs which James uttered, and which were drowned by the noisy gratitude of his attendants, were interpreted to mean thanks. But from the most trustworthy accounts, it appears that he was insensible to all that was passing around him. As soon as Lewis was again at Marley, he repeated to the court assembled there the announcement which he had made at Saint-Germain. The whole circle broke forth into exclamations of delight and admiration. What piety! What humanity! What magnanimity! Nor was this enthusiasm altogether feigned, for in the estimation of the greater part of that brilliant crowd, nations were nothing and princes everything. What could be more generous, more amiable, than to protect an innocent boy who was kept out of his rightful inheritance by an ambitious kinsman? The fine gentlemen and fine ladies who talked thus forgot that, besides the innocent boy and that ambitious kinsman, five millions and a half of Englishmen were concerned, who were little disposed to consider themselves as the absolute property of any master, and who were still less disposed to accept a master chosen for them by the French king. James lingered three days longer. He was occasionally sensible during a few minutes, and during one of these lucid intervals faintly expressed his gratitude to Lewis. On the sixteenth he died. His queen retired that evening to the nunnery of Shalott, where she could weep and pray undisturbed. She left Saint-Germain in joyous agitation, a herald made his appearance before the palace gate, and with sound of trumpet proclaimed in Latin, French, and English, King James the Third of England and Eighth of Scotland. The streets, in consequence doubtless of orders from the government, were illuminated, and the townsmen with loud shouts wished a long reign to their illustrious neighbour. The poor lad received from his ministers, and delivered back to them the seals of their offices, and held out his hand to be kissed. One of the first acts of his mock reign was to bestow some mock peerages in conformity with directions which he found in his father's will. Middleton, who had as yet no English title, was created Earl of Monmouth. Perth, who had stood high in the favour of his late master, both as an apostate from the Protestant religion and as the author of the last improvements on the thumbscrew, took the title of Duke. End of section 6《》Seven of Chapter Twenty Five of A History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Chapter Twenty Five, Section Seven. Meanwhile, the remains of James were escorted in the dusk of the evening, by a slender retinue to the chapel of the English Benedictines at Paris, and deposited there in the vain hope 
that at some future time they would be laid with kingly pomp at Westminster among the graves of the Plantagenets and Tudors. Three days after these humble obsequies, Lewis visited Saint-Germain in form. On the morrow the visit was returned. The French court was now at Versailles, and the pretender was received there in all points as his father would have been, sat in his father's armchair, took, as his father had always done, the right hand of the great monarch, and wore the long, violet-coloured mantle which was by ancient usage the mourning garb of the kings of France. There was on that day a great concourse of ambassadors and envoys, but one well-known figure was wanting. Manchester had sent off to Loo intelligence of the affront which had been offered to his country and his master, had solicited instructions, and had determined that, till these instructions should arrive, he would live in strict seclusion. He did not think that he should be justified in quitting his post without express orders, but his earnest hope was that he should be directed to turn his back in contemptuous defiance on the court, which had dared to treat England as a subject province. As soon as the fault into which Lewis had been hurried by pity, by the desire of applause, and by female influence was complete and irreparable, he began to feel serious uneasiness. His ministers were directed to declare everywhere that their master had no intention of affronting the English government, that he had not violated the Treaty of Rizik, that he had no intention of violating it, that he had merely meant to gratify an unfortunate family nearly related to himself by using names and observing forms which really meant nothing, and that he was resolved not to countenance any attempt to subvert the throne of William. Torcy, who had, a few days before, proved by irrefragable arguments that his master could not, without a gross breach of contract, recognize the pretender, imagined that sophisms which had not imposed on himself might possibly impose on others. He visited the English embassy, obtained admittance, and, as was his duty, did his best to excuse the fatal act which he had done his best to prevent. Manchester's answer to this attempt at explanation was as strong and plain as it could be in the absence of precise instructions. The instructions speedily arrived. The courier who carried the news of the recognition to Loo arrived there when William was at table with some of his nobles and some princes of the German Empire who had visited him in his retreat. The king said not a word, but his pale cheek flushed, and he pulled his hat over his eyes to conceal the changes of his countenance. He hastened to send off several messengers. One carried a letter commanding Manchester to quit France without taking leave. Another started for London with a dispatch which directed the Lord's Justices to send Poisson instantly out of England. England was already in a flame when it was first known there that James was dying. Some of his eager partisans formed plans and made preparations for a great public manifestation of feeling in different parts of the island but the insolence of Lewis produced a burst of public indignation which scarcely any malcontent had the courage to face. In the city of London, indeed, some zealots who had probably swallowed too many bumpers to their new sovereign played one of those senseless pranks which were characteristic of their party. They dressed themselves in coats bearing some resemblance to the tabards of heralds, rode through the streets, halted at some places, and muttered something which nobody could understand. 
It was at first supposed that they were merely a company of prize-fighters from Hockley in the Hall, who had taken this way of advertising their performances with back-sword, sword and buckler, and single falchion. But it was soon discovered that these gaudily dressed horsemen were proclaiming James the Third. In an instant the pageant was at an end. The mock kings at arms and pursuivants threw away their finery and fled for their lives in all directions, followed by yells and showers of stones. Already the Common Council of London had met, and had voted, without one dissentient voice, an address expressing the highest resentment at the insult which France had offered to the king and the kingdom. A few hours after this address had been presented to the regents, the livery assembled to choose a Lord Mayor. Duncombe, the Tory candidate, lately the popular favourite, was rejected, and a Whig alderman placed in the chair. All over the kingdom, corporations, grand juries, meetings of magistrates, meetings of freeholders, were passing resolutions breathing affection to William and defiance to Lewis. It was necessary to enlarge the London Gazette from four columns to twelve, and even twelve were too few to hold the multitude of loyal and patriotic addresses. In some of those addresses, severe reflections were thrown on the House of Commons. Our deliverer had been ungratefully requited, thwarted, mortified, denied the means of making the country respected and feared by neighbouring states. The factious wrangling, the penny-wise economy of three disgraceful years had produced the effect which might have been expected. His Majesty would never have been so grossly affronted abroad if he had not first been affronted at home but the eyes of his people were open. He only had to appeal from the representatives to the constituents, and he would find that the nation was still sound at heart. Poisson had been directed to offer to the Lord Justices explanations similar to those with which Torcy had attempted to appease Manchester. A memorial was accordingly drawn up and presented to Vernon, but Vernon refused to look at it. Soon a courtier arrived from Lou with the letter in which William directed his vice-regents to send the French agent out of the kingdom. An officer of the royal household was charged with the execution of the order. He repaired to Poisson's lodgings, but Poisson was not at home. He was supping at the Blue Posts a tavern much frequented by Jacobites, the very tavern, indeed, at which Charnock and his gang had breakfasted on the day fixed for the murderous ambuscade of Turnham Green. To this house the messenger went, and there he found Poisson at table with three of the most virulent Tory members of the House of Commons. Treddenham, who returned himself for St. Maul's, Hammond, who had been sent to Parliament by the High Churchman of the University of Cambridge, and Davenant, who had recently, at Poisson's suggestion, been rewarded by Lewis for some savage invectives against the Whigs, with a diamond ring worth three thousand pistoles. This supper-party was, during some weeks, the chief topic of conversation, the exultation of the Whigs was boundless. These, then, were the true English patriots, the men who could not endure a foreigner, the men who would not suffer His Majesty to bestow a moderate reward on the foreigners who had stormed Athlone, and turned the flank of the Celtic army at Agrim. It now appeared they could be on excellent terms with a foreigner, provided only that he was the emissary of a tyrant hostile to the liberty, the independence, and the religion of their country. The Tories, 
vexed and abashed, heartily wished that, on that unlucky day, their friends had been supping somewhere else. Even the bronze of Davenant's forehead was not proof to the general reproach. He defended himself by pretending that Poisson, with whom he had passed the whole days, who had corrected his scurrilous pamphlets, and who had paid him his shameful wages, was a stranger to him, and that the meeting at the blue posts was purely accidental. If his word was doubted, he was willing to repeat his assertion on oath. The public, however, which had formed a very correct notion of his character, thought that his word was worth as much as his oath, and that his oath was worth nothing. Meanwhile, the arrival of William was impatiently expected. From Loo he had gone to Breda, where he had passed some time in reviewing his troops, and in conferring with Marlborough and Heinzius. He had hoped to be in England early in October, but adverse winds detained him three weeks at The Hague. At length, in the afternoon of the 4th of November, it was known in London that he had landed early that morning at Margate. Great preparations were made for welcoming him to his capital on the following day, the 13th anniversary of his landing in Devonshire, but a journey across the bridge and along Cornhill and Cheapside, Fleet Street and the Strand, would have been too great an effort for his enfeebled frame. He accordingly slept at Greenwich, and thence proceeded to Hampton Court without entering London. His return, however, was celebrated by the populace, with every sign of joy and attachment. The bonfires blazed and the gunpowder roared all night. In every parish, from Mile End to St. James, was to be seen enthroned on the shoulders of stout Protestant porters, a pope, gorgeous in robes of tinsel and triple crown of pasteboard, and close to the ear of his holiness stood a devil with horns, cloven hoof, and a snaky tail. Even in his country house the king could find no refuge from the importunate loyalty of his people. Reputations from cities, counties, universities, besieged him all day. He was, he wrote to Heinzius, quite exhausted by the labour of hearing harangues and returning answers. The whole kingdom, meanwhile, was looking anxiously towards Hampton Court. Most of the ministers were assembled there. The most eminent men of the party which was out of power had repaired thither to pay their duty to the sovereign and to congratulate him on his safe return. It was remarked that Somers and Halifax, so malignantly persecuted a few months ago by the House of Commons, were received with such marks of esteem and kindness as William was little in the habit of vouchsafing to his English courtiers. The lower ranks of both the great factions were violently agitated. The Whigs, lately vanquished and dispirited, were full of hope and ardour. The Tories, lately triumphant and secure, were exasperated and alarmed. Both Whigs and Tories waited with intense anxiety for the decision of one momentous and pressing question. Would there be a dissolution? On the 7th of November the King propounded that question to his Privy Council. It was rumoured, and is highly probable, that Jersey, Wright and Hedges advised him to keep the existing Parliament but they were not men whose opinion was likely to have much weight with him, and Rochester, whose opinion might have had some weight, had set out to take possession of his viceroyalty just before the death of James, and was still in Dublin. William, however, had, as he owed to Heinzius, some difficulty in making up his mind. He had no doubt that a general election would give him a better House of Commons, 
but a general election would cause delay, and delay might cause much mischief. After balancing these considerations during some hours, he determined to dissolve. The writs were sent out with all expedition, and in three days the whole kingdom was up. Never, such was the intelligence sent from the Dutch embassy to The Hague, had there been more intriguing, more canvassing, more virulence of party feeling. It was in the capital that the first great contests took place. The decisions of the metropolitan constituent bodies were impatiently expected as auguries of the general result. All the pens of Grub Street, all the presses of Little Britain, were hard at work. Handbills for and against every candidate were sent to every voter. The popular slogans on both sides were indefatigably repeated. Presbyterian, Papist, Tool of Holland, Pensioner of France, where the appellations interchanged between the contending factions. The Whig cry was that the Tory members of the last two parliaments had, from a malignant desire to mortify the king, left the kingdom exposed to danger and insult, had unconstitutionally encroached both on the legislature and on the judicial functions of the House of Lords, had turned the House of Commons into a new star-chamber, had used as instruments of capricious tyranny those privileges which ought never to be employed but in defence of freedom, had persecuted, without regard to law, to natural justice or to decorum, the great commander who had saved the state at La Hogue, the great financier who had restored the currency and re-established public credit, the great judge whom all persons not blinded by prejudice acknowledged to be in virtue, in prudence, in learning and eloquence, the first of living English jurists and statesmen. The Tories answered that they had been only too moderate, only too merciful, that they had used the Speaker's warrant and the power of tacking only too sparingly, and that, if they ever again had a majority, the three Whig leaders, who now imagined themselves secure, should be impeached, not for high misdemeanours, but for high treason. It soon appeared that these threats were not likely to be very speedily executed. Four Whig and four Tory candidates contested the city of London. The show of hands was for the Whigs. A poll was demanded, and the Whigs polled nearly two votes to one. Sir John Levison Gower, who was supposed to have ingratiated himself with the whole body of shopkeepers by some parts of his parliamentary conduct, was put up for Westminster on the Tory interest, and the electors were reminded by puffs in the newspapers of the services which he had rendered to trade. But the dread of the French king, the Pope, and the pretender prevailed, and Sir John was at the bottom of the poll. Southwark not only returned Whigs, but gave them instructions of the most Whiggish character. End of section 7「Of Chapter Twenty Five of A History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter Twenty Five, Section Eight. In the country, Parties were more nearly balanced than in the capital. Yet the news from every quarter was that the Whigs had recovered part at least of the ground which they had lost. Wharton had regained his ascendancy in Buckinghamshire. Musgrave was rejected by Westmoreland. Nothing did more harm to the Tory candidates than the story of Poisson's farewell supper. Mr. 
we learn from their own acrimonious invectives that the unlucky discovery of the three members of parliament at the blue posts cost thirty honest gentlemen their seats one of the criminals treadenham escaped with impunity for the dominion of his family over the borough of st maul's was absolute even to a proverb the other two had the fate which they deserved Davenant ceased to sit for Bedwin. Hammond, who had lately stood high in the favour of the University of Cambridge, was defeated by a great majority, and was succeeded by the glory of the Whig party, Isaac Newton. There was one district to which the eyes of hundreds of thousands were turned with anxious interest. Gloucestershire. Would the patriotic and high-spirited gentry and yeomanry of that great county again confide their dearest interests to the impudent scandal of parliaments, the renegade, the slanderer, the mountebank, who had been, during thirteen years, railing at his betters of every party, with a spite restrained by nothing but the craven fear of corporal chastisement, and who had in the last parliament made himself conspicuous by the abject court which he had paid to lewis and by the impertinence with which he had spoken of william the gloucestershire election became a national affair portmanteaus full of pamphlets and broadsides were sent down from london every freeholder in the county had several tracts left at his door in every market-place on the market-day, papers about the brazen forehead, the viperous tongue, and the white liver of Jack Lowe, the French king's buffoon, flew about like flakes in a snowstorm. Clowns from the Cotswold Hills and the Forest of Dean who had votes, but who did not know their letters, were invited to hear these satires read and were asked whether they were prepared to endure the two great evils which were then considered by the common people of england as the inseparate concomitants of despotism to wear wooden shoes and to live on frogs the dissenting preachers and the clothiers were particularly zealous for howe was considered as the enemy both of conventicles and of factories Outvoters were brought up to Gloucester in extraordinary numbers. In the city of London the traders who frequented Blackwell Hall, then the great emporium for woollen goods, canvassed actively on the Whig side. Meanwhile, reports about the state of the King's health were constantly becoming more and more alarming. His medical advisers, both English and Dutch, were at the end of their resources, he had consulted by letter all the most eminent physicians of Europe, and as he was apprehensive that they might return flattering answers if they knew who he was, he had written under feigned names. To Fagon he had described himself as a parish priest. Fagon replied somewhat bluntly that such symptoms could have only one meaning and that the only advice which he had to give to the sick man was to prepare himself for death. Having obtained this plain answer, William consulted Fagon again without disguise, and obtained some prescriptions which were thought to have a little retarded the approach of the inevitable hour. But the great king's days were numbered. Headaches and shivering fits returned on him almost daily. He still rode and even hunted, but he had no longer that firm seat or that perfect command of the bridle for which he had once been renowned. Still all his care was for the future. The filial respect and tenderness of Albemarle had been almost a necessary of life to him but it was of importance that Heinzius should be fully informed, both as to the whole plan of the next campaign, and as to the state of the preparations. Albemarle was in full possession of the king's views on these subjects. He was therefore sent to the Hague, 
Heinzius was at that time suffering from indisposition, which was indeed a trifle when compared with the maladies under which William was sinking. But in the nature of William there was none of that selfishness which is the too common vice of invalids. On the twentieth day of February he sent to Heinzius a letter in which he did not even allude to his own sufferings and infirmities. I am, he said, infinitely concerned to learn that your health is not yet quite re-established. May God be pleased to grant you a speedy recovery. I am unalterably your good friend, William. Those were the last lines of that long correspondence. On the 20th of February, William was ambling on a favourite horse named Sorrel through the park of Hampton Court. He urged his horse to strike into a gallop just at the spot where a mole had been at work. Sorrel stumbled on the mole hill and went down on his knees. The king fell off and broke his collarbone. The bone was set and he returned to Kensington in his coach. The jolting of the rough roads of that time made it necessary to reduce the fracture again. To a young and vigorous man such an accident would have been a trifle. But the frame of William was not in a condition to bear even the slightest shock. He felt that his time was short, and grieved, with a grief such as only noble spirits feel, to think that he must leave his work but half finished. It was possible that he might still live until one of his plans should be carried into execution. He had long known that the relation in which England and Scotland stood to each other was at best precarious, and often unfriendly, and that it might be doubted whether, in an estimate of the British power, the resources of the smaller country ought not to be deducted from those of the larger. Recent events had proved that, without doubt, the two kingdoms could not possibly continue for another year to be on the terms which they had been during the preceding century, and that there must be between them either absolute union or deadly enmity. Their enmity would bring frightful calamities, not on themselves alone, but on all the civilized world. Their union would be the best security for the prosperity of both for the internal tranquillity of the island, for the just balance of power among European states, and for the immunities of all Protestant countries. On the 28th day of February, the Commons listened with uncovered heads to the last message that bore William's sign manual. An unhappy accident, he told them, had forced him to make to them in writing a communication which he would gladly have made from the throne. He had, in the first year of his reign, expressed his desire to see a union accomplished between England and Scotland. He was convinced that nothing could more conduce to the safety and happiness of both. He should think it his peculiar felicity if, before the close of his reign, some happy expedient could be devised for making the two kingdoms one, and he, in the most earnest manner, recommended the question to the consideration of the houses. It was resolved that the message should be taken into consideration on Saturday, the 7th of March. But on the 1st of March, humours of menacing appearance showed themselves in the king's knee. On the 4th of March he was attacked by fever. On the 5th his strength failed greatly, and on the 6th he was scarcely kept alive by cordials. The abjuration bill and a money bill were awaiting his assent. That assent he felt that he should not be able to give in person. He therefore ordered a commission to be prepared for his signature. His hand was now too weak to form the letters of his name, and it was suggested that a stamp should be prepared. On the 7th of March the stamp was ready. The Lord Keeper and the clerks of the Parliament came, according to usage, 
to witness the signing of the commission. But they were detained some hours in the antechamber while he was in one of the paroxysms of his malady. Meanwhile, the houses were sitting. It was Saturday the 7th, the day on which the commons had resolved to take into consideration the question of the union with Scotland. But that subject was not mentioned. It was known that the king had but a few hours to live, and the members asked each other anxiously whether it was likely that the abjuration and money bills would be passed before he died. After sitting long in the expectation of a message, the commons adjourned till six in the afternoon. By that time William had recovered himself sufficiently to put the stamp on the parchment which authorized his commissioners to act for him. In the evening, when the houses had assembled, Black Rod knocked. The commons were summoned to the bar of the lords. The commission was read. The abjuration bill and the malt bill became laws and both houses adjourned till nine o'clock in the morning of the following day. The following day was Sunday, but there was little chance that William would live through the night. It was of the highest importance that within the shortest possible time after his decease, the successor designated by the Bill of Rights and the Act of Succession should receive the homage of the estates of the realm and be publicly proclaimed in the council, and the most rigid Pharisee in the Society for the Reformation of Manners could hardly deny that it was lawful to save the state, even on the Sabbath. The king, meanwhile, was sinking fast. Albemarle had arrived at Kensington from The Hague, exhausted by rapid travelling. His master kindly bade him to go to rest for some hours, and then summoned him to make his report. That report was in all respects satisfactory. The States-General were in the best temper. The troops, the provisions, and the magazines were in the best order. Everything was in readiness for an early campaign. William received the intelligence with the calmness of a man whose work was done. He was under no illusion as to his danger. "'I am fast drawing,' he said." to my end. His end was worthy of his life. His intellect was not for a moment clouded. His fortitude was the more admirable because he was not willing to die. He had very lately said to one of those whom he most loved, You know that I never feared death. There have been times when I should have wished it, but now that this great new prospect is opening before me, I do wish to stay here a little longer. Yet no weakness, no querulousness, disgraced the noble close of that noble career. To the physicians the king returned his thanks graciously and gently. I know that you have done all that skill and learning could do for me, but the case is beyond your art, and I submit. From the words which escaped him he seemed to be frequently engaged in mental prayer. Burnet and Tennyson remained many hours in the sick-room. He professed to them his firm belief in the truth of the Christian religion, and received the sacrament from their hands with great seriousness. The antechambers were crowded all night with lords and privy councillors. He ordered several of them to be called in, and exerted himself to take leave of them with a few kind and cheerful words. Among the English who were admitted to his bedside were Devonshire and Ormond. But there were in the crowd those who felt as no Englishman could feel. Friends of his youth who had been true to him, and to whom he had been true, through all vicissitudes of fortune who had served him with unalterable fidelity when his secretaries of state, his treasury, and his admiralty had betrayed him, who had never on any field of battle, or in an atmosphere tainted with loathsome and deadly disease, shrunk from placing their own lives in jeopardy to save his, and 
whose truth he had at the cost of his own popularity rewarded with bounteous munificence. He strained his feeble voice to thank Avoquerque for the affectionate and loyal services of thirty years. To Albemarle he gave the keys of his closet and of his private drawers. You know, he said, what to do with them. By this time he could scarcely respire. Can this, he said to the physicians, last long? He was told that the end was approaching. He swallowed a cordial and asked for Bentinck. Those were his last articulate words. Bentinck instantly came to the bedside, bent down and placed his ear close to the king's mouth. The lips of the dying man moved, but nothing could be heard. The king took the hand of his earliest friend and pressed it tenderly to his heart. In that moment, no doubt, all that had cast a slight passing cloud over their long and pure friendship was forgotten. It was now between seven and eight in the morning. He closed his eyes and gasped for breath. The bishops knelt down and read the commendatory prayer. When it ended, William was no more. When his remains were laid out, it was found that he wore next to his skin a small piece of black silk ribband. The lords-in-waiting ordered it to be taken off. It contained a gold ring and a lock of the hair of Mary. End of section 8 End of chapter 25 of the History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay